Cristo. Uh, well, I'm just going to be adding a few um, comments to that um, very impressive uh, analysis of the overall dynamic of the crisis. And um, I, what, what I, my remarks also perhaps are a transition to what we'll be looking at tomorrow, which is the political dimensions uh, of the crash. Uh, and of the, the, the economic crisis. And those are manifest nowhere more clearly than in the Eurozone uh, with the likelihood uh, or the distinct possibility of a number of important Eurozone states um, being forced out of the, the Euro or uh, being forced into other of the further measures of employers offensive that Bob has been talking about. But before looking at that, I want to say that um, the picture here then is one in which um, inequality and poverty in the world, and in particular redundant production, uh, creates a massive and, and growing deficit of demand, uh, which puts tremendous downward pressure on the rate of profit. Uh, and um, uh, creates the distinct possibility of a, a downward spiral which is only halted by government guarantees of private debt, growing private indebtedness, um, uh, and governments really backing, uh, enticing the poor uh, and the low paid uh, into buying assets which, uh, and taking on debt and mortgage which they won't be able to um, uh, handle and which will drive them into, uh, which will lead them to be evicted from their new homes and um, uh, to have the heavy cloud of debt hanging over them. So th this is a, a very nasty uh, story which is still playing out uh, in front of our eyes. And um, could, has already had uh, tremendous political repercussions. Uh, I, I want to ask what could be done about this. There have been the ar arrival of new movements of the left that claim to be able to confront the phenomenon. Uh, it's a phenomenon obviously not of their making. Uh, and um, why should they be expected to solve it? Well, they, they have to come up with routes out of uh, the mire of the crisis and of the traps created uh, by um, uh, the, the policies that uh, Bob has been outlining. And um, uh, what one example I'd just like to mention is um, Susan referred to the fact we had this interview with Rafael Correa, the president of Ecuador, and one of the things he gave us a fascinating account of was uh, the problem of Ecuador's public debt, which, uh, like many third world countries, you know, he came into office finding the country was saddled with enormous debts for a small, poor country like Ecuador of around seven or eight billion dollars. And before the crisis hit, one of the first things they did coming into the government was to set up this audit commission that would sift through, examine all the debts with which the state was burdened and would come up with recommendations. Were there, were, were, was correct information supplied uh, by uh, those, the, 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 those who'd been lending the money? Uh, had they tried to influence Ecuadorian officials by corrupt means? Had, they, had there been payoffs or kickbacks 
uh, were they linked to arms trading, to the purchase of uh, US or French uh, armaments? Uh, and in the end, the Audit Commission was able to go through this entire structure of debt and was able to un uh, identify over three billion that could be just repudiated and other, uh, other billions that could be reduced in, in size. And this was done, and it was actually accepted, and it was done in a sufficiently solid and effective way that even the vulture funds uh, have not been able to dislodge it or uh, to mount a successful attack on it. And um, I think that there's an interesting example here, because I think part of the problem that Bob is sketching for us is massively indebted societies, and the debts exist at every le level, not just government, but also, as Bob was stressing, households. And of course, also, significantly, though sometimes to a lesser extent, corporations. And also, significantly, and to a very great extent, banks and financial institutions. We really don't know the situation of most of the big banks. Probably a lot of these big American and German banks are heavily invested in Greek bonds. That's probably the reason why the German Chancellor uh, doesn't, uh, you know, uh, has such a visceral hatred of anything that might resemble a write-down of the value of those, of those bonds. Uh, it would not be surprising if there are immensely powerful material interests at play, as well as, of course, free market ideology, which maybe it's not doing the whole trick all by itself. So um, there are these massive layers of debt, and. In the, so far as the financial institutions are concerned, many of them are concealed within the shadow banking system. The shadow banking system, which is unregulated uh, uh, by the public authority, which is unreported on, or, you know, uh, that's why it's in the shadows. That's why it's a shadow banking system. It's not open. We, the, the, and the assets that have been valued there are valued only by models or, uh, uh, or by so called over-the-counter uh, uh, transactions. So they're not market. The, the, the pursuit of free markets has come to the point where underpinning the whole market system are assets whose value has in fact never been tested on the market. So I think there would be a case for an audit commission that looks at the banks, that brings the, uh, the banks banking system from out of the shadows and looks also at household economics uh, uh, the, uh, and looks at the conditions under which families and households were sold uh, or provided with mortgages uh, so that they could buy houses. Uh, were they, were they, what, what was the fine print? Were they told the risks and dangers? Is there a strong case for writing down or even just cancelling? those mortgages. That's something which a determined radical government could do. And it, it would be amb ambiguous because it would be good for capitalism. Uh, it might restore demand. Uh, uh, if you cancelled half of the mortgage outstanding in Spain, uh, it would be a massive fillet to demand. There's no doubt about that at all. But um, uh, of course, there'd be interests that would be affected in the banks we'd be insistently told that the pension funds, uh, that they were going to lose value. And there'd be some truth in that, though if the Audit Commission did their work, they could probably identify that many so-called pension funds are really scams operated in order to evade taxation by the wealthy. And it's only the upper, the upper, temp, the richest 10% of workers can have 50% uh, 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 of all the tax-protected and tax-favoured uh, pension funds. Uh, so there's plenty of scope for discounting uh, and writing down mortgages without leading a, a death blow to the savings of ordinary workers. Uh, there's a, a task to be done there, but the professionals are there and uh, the public support could be generated um, to look into that. Um, Bob talked about the Keynesian measures based on uh, asset uh, prices uh, and uh, certainly uh, as we try to restore demand 
uh, surely we won't just remain within the sphere of circulation. Surely it'll be important. Uh, I mean, Keynesianism, its weakness, whether traditional Keynesianism or newfangled Keynesianism, it just works with broad concepts of public demand. Uh, as well as demand, there's production. And Bob was referring to redundant production. And there, there, there is masses of re redundant production. In a use value economy, a radical government could identify forms of real value enhancing investment uh, to do with green technology, to do with um, uh, needed infrastructure, to do with needed health investments in health and education. Uh, so it, with the concept, the general concept of a use value economy, it would be possible to develop programs that went beyond the sphere of circulation into that of production. Uh, there's a book by Mariana Mazzucato called um, the, the Public Entrepreneur, uh, which begins to look at some of the actions. And I should explain that she is a social democrat who accepts capitalism, but she does have some interesting ideas and they could be pushed by a really radical government in, in even more uh, fundamental directions. So I'd like to conclude by saying uh, this may sound a bit visionary and um, uh, 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 you know how, how could a use value economy or how could that really be cancelled by that? How could you have such massive changes in ownership of vital assets? Well I would just answer with two historical points. One historical point is the bailout. The bailout I believe to be something really big and important and fundamental not only in finance and economics, but in the whole ideological climate. The state was called upon uh, by the Treasury Secretary and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank to salvage the gigantic banks. They were brought into the money room and they were told that within an hour they had to sign a document that virtually nationalized most of them. And they did it because there was no alternative. And whether on the right or the left, the public eventually noticed it. Even the US Congress didn't go along with the whole thing just as one easy pushover. It had to be brought to vote on it twice. And of course, the Tea Party developed out of this. But also, Syriza and the, um, the radical Greek left de developed out a reaction to events like this. And the idea that debts could be repudiated, the idea uh, this is something which now has to be taken seriously. Uh, actually, Wolfgang Munkau, one of the leading financial commentators of the Financial Times newspaper, just two weeks ago said Syriza and Podemos were right. Uh, this is a middle of the road uh, a German um, uh, business journalist, but he said Syriza, and, you know, so. It's a new climate we're in, and we should be as radical as we can, because the difficult thing is to be as radical as reality itself uh, after events of that sort. And then I'd just like to say that I can myself remember, actually, Susan did mention early trip, uh, or one of them, Perry, came uh, was on that too, uh, to Cuba in the early 60s. And you could see a use value economy with unemployment coming down from 30% uh, to virtually zero, uh, with uh, money going to education, with agrarian reform, with youngsters going, of, of teenagers going out in the countryside to um, campaign against illiteracy among the country dwellers, with the setting up of an advanced health care system. Uh, interestingly enough, to begin with, it was a Keynesian, it was Javier Pazos, director of the National Bank, said we need to give a fillip to demand and um, uh, we can bring unemployment right down. Across two years, that actually happened and it built huge support for the Cuban revolution from the Cuba masses. I mean, they already supported the overthrow of Batista, but it gave them a glimpse of fundamental social and economic uh, uh, transformations. Um, 
and there was going to be hardship along the line, but really the first two or three years were a tremendous proof that by transforming production as well as finance, uh, by acting boldly, uh, it's possible to develop a new economic and above all a new social model. And I have allowed myself just that minute or two on Cuba because we, we meet today on a historic day of victory for the Cuban Revolution. Um, as m some of you may know, it's been announced that the United States <coughs> government, after another, is it 60 years or 50, 52 years or whatever it is, 55 years, they have recognized the Cuban government, something, and the Cuban Revolution, something they've... Uh, of course, they're not resigning and until there's a quite new balance in Congress, you know, there's still the, the problem that Cuba has to face of uh, uh, the blockade, uh, which uh, uh, creates so many problems for the, for the country. But to uh, have obtained this U.S. recognition of the government, something that uh, should never have been lost, of course, uh, is a massive confession of failure of a whole strategy to strangle the Cuban Revolution. And th so that's a happy note to end on. Thank you. Si todavía, si todavía quedan fuerzas y alguien quiere hacer alguna alguna pregunta alguna pregunta rápidamente antes de concluir la, la sesión podemos hacerla ahora brevemente acumularemos varias para que contesten no, no. Eh, que contesten conjuntamente Es, es una pregunta rápida, eh, casi estoy sin voz además, eh, a los dos ponentes, el papel que ha tenido desde los años 80 para acá en la transformación, en el cambio, en los criterios de riesgo de las entidades bancarias, cuando se concedían antes los créditos aleja, aleja un poco el micrófono. se ponía unos límites. Aleja un poco, espera a ver. Se ponía... ¿Qué canal es? Dos, canal dos. Es una pregunta rápida y es en cuanto... Es que tengo la voz tomada. No, no que lo separes el micro un poco. Así. Así. Y es el cambio que ha habido desde los 80 para acá en toda Europa y en Estados Unidos, yo creo que desde los 70, en los criterios de riesgos de análisis de hipotecas, porque en hasta los 70-80 se concedía el 80% del valor de tasación del bien y la renta destinada a pago de la deuda total de una familia tenía que ser del 33% máximo de la renta disponible. Cuando se empezó a titulizar las hipotecas, y con una avaricia los bancos empezamos a hacer, empezaron a hacer eh, todo un desarrollo de valores ficticios sobre las propias hipotecas, la titulización yo creo que es el, uno de los enormes orígenes del problema, porque la titulización lo que creó es, y mi pregunta es esa, para terminar, si la titulización está en el origen de la especulación y de la crisis. So, eh, solo yeah. 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 Eh, solo un par de cositas no sé si el análisis lo vais a colgar porque con la densidad que, que ha tenido seguramente a muchas personas nos gustaría leerlo redactado no sé si lo vais a publicar para que lo informéis si se puede conseguir el texto eh, ahora o dentro de un futuro y luego eh, la pregunta es eh, dentro de lo que he podido seguir de, de la exposición, no sé si las implicaciones del análisis al hablar de cómo se han ido controlando, por ejemplo, los tipos de interés, cómo se fueron creando los productos derivados financieros y tal, hay, una, hay un relativo control 
de la clase capitalista sobre las, las consecuencias de sus acciones en el medio plazo o, o en el largo plazo. No sé qué piensas de las, si las implicaciones de tu análisis eh, hablan de un eh, control relativo sobre las consecuencias de, de sus acciones o, o no las controlan eh, prácticamente en cierto margen. Gracias. Ok, cer cerramos con esta cuestión y mañana se pueden retomar parte de las, eh, de las que hayan quedado pendientes. This is the last one. Sí, un, una pregunta rápida. ¿Cómo es posible que eh, en el análisis que se ha hecho de, de, la, de la, digamos, virtualización de la, de la economía capitalista, cómo es posible que esta virtualización no haya eh, eh, provocado que... que, que <coughs> Que se, que se parase un poco el desastre ecológico, sino que lo, sino que ha venido aumentando. ¿no? Es curioso que la economía real desaparezca, pero sin embargo la. I mean, uh, let me take the last question first because it has the quickest answer, or else the by far the longest one. I mean, I'm not in any position to give a better. I mean, the the question was asked quite properly rhetorically. Why isn't, why, why isn't the ecological crisis close? I believe what was being asked is why not closer to the center of your uh, presentation? And the only reason I would say is because if that was going to be the center of my presentation, I, I wouldn't be able to speak about anything else. And secondly, if that was going to be the center of my presentation, it would be much better to get someone much better informed than I am about the ecological crisis, not that certain huge and obvious outlines of the way in which capitalism necessarily by the necessity of expansion in order to make possible the continuing profit making, uh, that, that basic idea, I think, we all have, and it's obviously got to be our starting point. Beyond that, others can do much better than I uh, in, in answering. I mean, capitalists can't live without expanding. They don't have a choice of where to expand. If they have to expand where it's ecologically most catastrophic, say, with an, uh, a great new innovation, quote, uh, that is the most uh, destructive of the environment, they have to do that. That's, that's the bottom line, but it's really the bottom line. The other questions, um, the other two questions, I think, were really ran together. I mean, uh, one was a, I mean, they, they were, they were, one was a question, but seemed to be a technical question about securitization. Securitization means that the, um, that uh, the banks take the, mortgages, they allow the mortgage lenders to issue mortgages to people, and particularly relevant to the other side of the question, particularly to, particularly to, particularly to um, uh, people who really don't qualify for, for mortgages. They t turn them into, as you said, into securities, then they sell them on to the, uh, to the uh, investing public, so to speak, hedge funds, uh, city governments, etc. So that is an example of, sort of, quote, modern finance. And it goes along with the question, well, in this modern finance, is that under, the con under control? Do they know what they're doing? Um, you know, they can have very bad outcomes as we've seen. And is this the, the chaos that uh, they are welcoming? Well, I think it's absolutely clear yet that yes, both of these things are true because the chaos will, will not, is exactly what is being welcomed, but it they will not um, be required to pay. So let me be a little bit more concrete. The way in which uh, banks make profits these days uh, is not by so-called intermediation, where they move money from people who have surplus of money to people who, I mean, corporations, who
who are going to need it to invest and expand. That's the whole point of what I was saying is that that's not what's happening. The technical way of putting that, though, uh, is that corporations, to the extent they do need money, don't get it from the banks these days. They, they go on to the so-called bond market and directly borrow. So what is that, where does that leave the banks? Where that leaves the banks is making money on what is innocently titled proprietary trading, trading in their own name. What do they do when they trade in their own name? They buy mortgage-backed securities and so on and sell them on. Or they keep them and, and uh, take the money as they go. Well, isn't this suicidal? How can, how can they actually allow this to happen? And what is the government doing about it? I would say there are three key points in understanding this process, and I think they come back to the politics that, that Robin, for us, the politics that Robin was raising. First point, the government understands and has since the end of the 70s when it, in the U.S., saw it couldn't revive manufacturing that the way to go is to support financial institutions, open the way to financial expansion by way of deregulation of one after another new field. Those people who can get in first make a lot of money. But note, at each point, these are speculative expansions. Well. How is that possible? Why are these stupid banks going and in, in investing when clearly the speculation, no one knows how to speculate and continue to win when they know that sooner or later there's going to be a crash? Well, as we know, there's been a huge institutional transformation of the banks that makes exactly this possible. Banks are no longer... Um, private institutions where the people who are, own them have, so to speak, the skin in the game and make investments on which they will lose. We, the people who now are the leaders of the banks are completely separated from the stockholders. Used to be partnerships, owner and investor the same. Now the investors the, the, I mean, the people who are deciding what speculation goes, buying those mortgages and selling them, or even worse, holding on to them, these are able to push that, make millions, so billions, so long as they, there is not a failure to pay. And note, in this instance, it was, it was absolutely crystal clear that the, People who had bought these mortgages would not be able to pay after a, you know a year or two or a few years. So it was a certainty these mortgages would come a cropper. But while the music played, those who ran the company made huge fortunes, not by owning the stock so much, but by huge salaries and bonuses and a little bit in owning the stocks. So what happens? Of course, like you said, they must be crazy because there's going to be a crash. But as the head of the uh, Bank of England has explained, as uh, explained by many commentators in the U.S. scene, as early as the 90s, Goldman Sachs and company realized that this could be a problem. So they opened the way, in, in a, I won't have time for the institution, they opened the way to the knowledge of the bailout. So you have deregulation, the separation of profit making from ownership and, and therefore you don't pay if you, once there's a collapse, and then the bailout. To me, the general, the general lesson from this is that what finance about is about has ceased to be primarily, quote, economic or productive. It's about politics and power, and that, that at each point in the process, profit making is integrally connected to the, to the bank's power. 
For this audience, you probably don't need any further information about the bank's power in the U.S. If there was ever any doubt about the two-party system in the 90s, there was a tight alliance created between the Democratic Party and the, and the financiers, paralleling the tight alliance between the Republican Party and the financiers, and this secured basically this arrangement. Now, it seems to me that while in the past I would have sat back and said, those people who are saying, oh, you're looking at finance, that's just the froth on the, you know, on the economy, and you're not getting to the basis in production, and therefore you're a Keynesian reformist, um, or worse, a populist. It seems to me today, the heart of the economy is finance. The finance forms the, the heart and the and is the template for profit making everywhere. It, you know, from in the corporations where they're uh, uh, essentially paying out all the you know paying out all the corporate corporate profits, not investing them in university where all the money is being politically funneled to the to the top you know the the, the top officers. So we're talking about a politicization of the economy, and we're talking particularly about the power of finance and the lack of function for finance and the state support for finance. I think in this instance, although we don't have the power yet to go in this direction, we certainly have the power to make clear what's going on and what is so ugly and amazingly clear is the way the banks are not even satisfied with this, but they have to cheat by the trillions, setting the key interest rates, fixing the foreign exchange market, and, and doing things like making big bucks off of the, of the uh, laundering of drug money. So if we begin, I think, to tell this story as it is, which is paralleled by the lack of function for finance, the power but lack of function, and the total connection of the, of the political system with that, I think we have the way to go, and it's not a reformist way to go necessarily. The reforms, but there's also revolt, and I think that's where we should be putting, so to speak, our marbles today, because we're so far from an economy which is doing any production. Okay. Robin, do you want to say something? No? Okay. Cerramos pues aquí esta, esta sesión un tanto accidentada y nos vemos mañana a las 6 de la tarde. Okay?